Thank you. I, I'm going to um, get straight in. We talked, we've talked about the medical experiment on children this morning, and I really want to talk about the social experiment. I, I'm going to indulge myself a bit here um, with this photograph. Um, this is a photograph of two 10-year-old girls, and it was taken in 1969. Uh, they weren't trans children. And as soon as you put the word trans together with the word child, of course, it politicizes the child and allows us to treat that child as an adult. The word trans is heard and the word child uh, is not heard, it's hidden. Um, so back in the 60s and 70s, the mother of these two girls did buy them clothes from the boys section of the Littlewoods catalog uh, and otherwise just didn't pay any attention to this uh, because she knew they were children. And I was thinking about the change from the 60s and 70s to now, what's changed uh, within the culture that now these two 10-year-old girls would probably be called trans boys. So um, what happened to these two girls? They had a terrible time through puberty and adolescence, they fought against becoming women, they had all the eating disorders, a bit of self-harm, and this went on right through their 20s for both of them. And then they both married and became mothers and came to terms with being, woman, being women, um, even feel, feeling proud of being uh, women. Um, still rebels. I know now, and it took me many years to unpick this, but I know now what I was rebelling against then in not wanting to become a woman. Um, it wasn't about not wanting to be a woman, but it was about not wanting to be what society told me a woman was. And there's a big difference there. Um, because this, yeah, sorry, this is, this is me and my twin sister. <laughs> sorry, I've... Um, so, it, looking back, I think I didn't see myself as a boy. I was, I was absolutely, fiercely a boy. But I don't think I really saw myself as a boy, but as a human being. And that was a category I felt excluded from as a girl growing up in the sexist 70s culture. So I want to know what's changed now because the culture has changed completely. It's a completely different landscape that this generation of girls is growing up in. Um, and I make no apology about talking mostly about girls today. I, 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 I generally talk about both sexes, but actually um, this is my area. But also, you know, being female, but also I think that medicine has traditionally ignored women and the female body. And I see the same happening in the area of gender dysphoria, about as if both sexes come to this for exactly the same reasons. And I think it's absolutely critical that we separate out boys and girls, the female sex, the male sex, and the different re some, some reasons are the same. I think autism spans both sexes. I think there are reasons that are similar. There are also reasons that are different that we need to look at honestly and openly. Um, so back in the 70s, the culture was very, you know, it was TV, it was radio, um, newspapers and books, magazines. That's where I got the message of what it was to be a woman. Um, and today, of course, there's the internet. So today's generation is brought up in the world of really, really fast moving images, um, a lot of youth culture is hidden from adults because adults haven't, or, or my generation haven't quite come to terms with what the internet can do and, what, and what's on there. Um, but it's also a culture of, um, uh, when, when I started out in 2015, it was mostly Tumblr and Reddit, and now it's moved to TikTok and Discord and, Snapchat, um, still on YouTube. 
But that cultural landscape for girls has become so um, intense. The messages, the number of messages this generation get is, gets is so much more than in my generation when I was growing up. And on the one hand, it's Instagram. It's impossible standards of the so-called female ideal um, on, on Instagram. It is abusive and degrading and violent porn, which is available at the click of a button through smartphones in schools. So there's that, and then there's trans. And the online and media culture that girls are growing up with today is absolutely dominated by these themes. And everything that adolescents are learning online about gender identity is being consolidated now in schools, which are teaching it as fact. And yet the professionals we trust don't seem to have a clue about what this generation of adolescents is exposed to constantly, everywhere, online, in the media, in schools, everywhere, the same message. So I had a meeting last week with two members of a UK major royal college who asked me, do you work with trans kids? And I say to this question, well, no, I work with parents and teachers. But it's as if that I'm not qualified to work in this area unless I work with trans kids. And she said, one, she said, is this being taught in schools? Um, and two, she said, well, their focus was on listening to young people themselves. That's what I hear all the time. We listen to the young people. Um, but young people don't live in a bubble. They don't live completely separate to their culture and un completely uninfluenced by their society, by the society that they're growing up in. And I have never known an adult rights campaign that so aggressively and directly targets children and adolescents. And that is from, from the colors on the flag, the baby pink and baby blue, to the message of the Glitter family coming and joining our Glitter family. This is um, actually Rachel McKinnon, who is now Veronica Ivey, inviting kids online to walk away from unsupportive or disrespectful parents and come and join his Glitter family or queer family. I'm actually going to not focus on the internet. I'm going to focus on books. I'm going to show you a selection of messages that children and adolescents are getting from books now. And, and it's because I think children trust authors. Authors of children's books become like a friend to a child. Um, and you're, a sort of, you're an expert if you've written a book and you have an authority, but books also validate and mainstream ideas that adolescents may be introduced to initially on social media. So books are published by grown-ups uh, by grown -ups in the publishing industry. They're stocked in libraries, including school libraries, and they're displayed proudly by bookshop chains like Waterstones. So they must be right, mustn't they? They can't be harmful to children if all of those adults in all of those different positions are promoting these books. So it's partly where the message comes from that has, has the impact. And I think books, for that reason, have, do have a big impact. And if you look at the messages these books send to children and adolescents, it's so clear that children are being used as foot soldiers to further the adult activist campaign and its main objectives. And the political message that children are being sent from the earliest age is disguised by themes that directly appeal to children, um, such as being a good friend, being kind, being yourself and accepting other children who are different. So this is just a selection of books for primary years from uh, reception onwards. And that fir first, on the one on the left there, Introducing Teddy, was the first book that I came across uh, that was published by a major publisher. 
uh, Bloomsbury, this was in 2016, and somebody alerted to me to this, that Bloomsbury were publishing this book. So this book's, the message of this book is for three, year, three years old and upwards, that um, Teddy wears a bow tie, because Teddy's actually a boy, uh, but Teddy becomes a girl by putting the bow tie, uh, the bow tie into uh, changing it into a hair bow. So you're getting the, the reinforcement of stereotypes, plus the story is that Teddy's friend remains Teddy's friend and accepts unquestioningly that Teddy is a girl. So there's a template for how to respond to anybody who, any boy who says he's a girl or girl she, who says she's a, uh, a boy. The... Um, Penguin Land series by Giles, I think, was, was published before, in the year, certainly by 2015. Being me in Penguin Land, uh, that, that's the message of being yourself. And also, again, the message of to be a good friend, you don't question, you just believe. It says it can be easier to tell a friend I'm not a girl because I'm a boy, but either way, we'll stick together because that's what friends are for. And what friend would deny that I'm a... Uh, a, a boy or a girl because I say so. Um, are you a boy or are you a girl? That's um, the message of this one is really you've got, it's no business of yours to know what sex anybody is. You haven't got a right to ask them. The only person who wants to know what sex Tiny is in the book is the bully, the one who thinks that girls shouldn't play football. So probably a conservative bully. Um, Anyway, th so children are taught very clearly it's not right to ask to know what sex somebody is and you shouldn't ask them. The book in the hidden in the middle there is Jamie. It's trans, a Cinderella story. Jamie's a lesbian. Jamie fancies the princess, but Jamie turns into a straight boy and the princess tells Jamie, princess falls in love with Jamie because Jamie is the only or really authentic person at the ball. So there's the message for young lesbians. You can change yourself into a straight boy and to really be authentic and to get the hand of the princess. Uh, you couldn't get mo much more obvious than that. 10,000 dresses, um, there we have pronouns. Um, Bailey is a boy who's referred to as she throughout. Bailey loves making dresses. Uh, but Bailey's family, brother, dad, don't accept that Bailey should be happy making dresses because boys don't do that. And Bailey meets a girl who accepts that Bailey is a girl and they live happily ever after. And children get confused about pronouns. Um, so building on these themes, adolescents are targeted with message that will, I think, specifically appeal to the vulnerable groups who are being referred to the Tavistock now. So teenage girls, autistic kids, kids from care homes. I think those, uh, th these books, and lesbian and gay kids, that's automatic because, because they will be the ones who are mostly um, or gender non-stereotyping um, uh, kids who, who, who will be pulled into this. But amongst those groups, um, I think the, the messages are targeted uh, very, very directly. Um, so there's a message that you can turn your gender dysphoria, your discomfort with your sex and your body into gender euphoria. You become trans and everything um, is brilliant. It trans, it becoming trans is the answer. Uh, free to be me. So there's uh, a message to adolescents who are searching for their identity. Um, you can find your identity. This is one way. And it's, a it's a journey to, to finding your true identity automatically goes through gender. So the main themes, I think, of, of, of the adult activist mov movement is that gender identity is innate. Sex is a social construct. Um, Men should be, uh, trans women are women. Only you know who you are. Um, men should be allowed into women's sports and women's spaces and because you have no right to question their self-identity. Medical transition is right and normal and not harmful for children. And trans rights don't impact on other people's rights. So I'm gonna go through a few examples to show how those political messages are sent to children but hidden under themes that will particularly appeal to adolescents. So I've just selected a, just a few examples. Oh, and this is, 
that's just, it's not a very good slide, it's just a graph to show the spread of that term gender assigned at birth or sometimes sex assigned at birth. It really, sh it is on, on Google, online, and it really shot up around the year 2000. So that's become a really established term now that what, that uh, 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 your sex is only assigned to you at birth and that you, can, you can change it. Um, so this is a book, this is a new book called Jamie that's out, um, that it's about a, uh, an 11 year old non-binary child by L.D. Lipinski. It's a joyful stu uh, story of friendship, bravery and acceptance and it's for nine years plus. And it says, when you're born, the midwife or doctor decides whether you're a boy or a girl based on the way your body looks. But for some people, looks can be deceiving and they're given the wrong gender. Gender dysphoria is the uncomfortable feeling some people get when their true gender is different from the one they were given at birth. No matter how someone looks, they may identify as male, female, non-binary, or another label altogether. The important thing to remember is to listen when people tell you about themselves and to be kind and caring. So all the messages of political activism are there. That could have been taken straight from, the, from Stonewall's website. And there's the normal obfuscation of language um, between gender and sex. Male and female are placed as equivalents of a subjective identity, non-binary. Um, so when you're a teen and you're trying to find out who you are and what your identity is, you are on a journey from childhood to adulthood. Um, and you can get a book that shows you how to navigate that journey, to explore and find out who you really are, which of course means finding your, your gender identity. You can navigate your exploration with this book, support your journey, and, and of course, celebrate who you really are. Um, if you feel awkward in social situations, if you're autistic, for example, um, or ASD, um, or you just feel socially awkward, as a lot of teens do, this workbook um, will help you navigate social situations, express yourself, and find support. So the introspective teen, who's always con you know, constantly especially the teenage, gir teenage girls constantly evaluating themselves and comparing themselves and measuring, measuring herself against the ideals and, and is being encouraged to analyze every single aspect of her personality, her interests, how she likes to dress in terms of gender. I mean, is this conducive to good mental health? I don't think so. I think this is causing or exacerbating any existing mental health problems. There's a journal that you can, you, that you can fill in. Uh, you know, I think teenagers should get out in nature more. I don't think this is good for adolescent mental health. You can even take a gender identity test. This is actually online. And this test will tell you that governments are in charge of, of labeling kids sex at birth. And that's why we're living in a cisgender dominant world. Um, this one, um, I think this, this one is particularly appealing to girls. Um, finding your inner beauty, because of course girls have to be beautiful somehow, don't they? If they're not beautiful physically, girls are told, yes, but you're beautiful inside. Um, as if they have to be beautiful in some way. Um, they don't. <laughs> What does it even mean? Um, but I think this one, you, c you can be born in the mountains or you can be born in the sea. Uh, and, and, and this particular writer of a book called Gender Queer, uh, who uses E-M e ear pronouns, um, the answer is, is, is gender, gender uh, non-binary, sorry, non-binary, uh, um, which is also a beautiful, but that's a wild landscape in between the mountains and the sea. That would appeal to any sort of <laughs> romantic teen. <laughs> um, 
So the next message. So this is you know your this is uh, your your finding your true authentic self. So this message is hammered home um, that your gender identity is your true authentic self and your sex is 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 just assigned to you. But also you are part of the most vulnerable and persecuted minority. So you need a self a self care workbook. And again, I think this is more appealing to teenage girls who are always encouraging in sort of self care. Um, and so this is a colouring book and journal, <coughs> excuse me, for trans and non-binary people. So the message that you are a part of a, of a, of a persecuted minori minority is really appealing to the teen who feels unpopular, uh, bullied and misunderstood. And uh, you're so persecuted, of course, you'll need a teen survival guide. And this book will tell you that there's no one way to be trans. We all have a gender identity. It's what we know ourselves to be and something no one else can feel. It's our inner sense of self. So this is the tribe that will accept you unconditionally. Imagine if you're from the care system and you've never had a, you know, a, a real, what you can feel is a real family. And here's this new family welcoming you in, absolutely non-judgmental. You can be whoever you want to be and nobody's got the right to question you. You don't have to prove that you're woman enough as you've always felt you've had to prove so far and failed. Now you can be trans and that can mean whatever you want it to mean. And you can't fail. Um, but also this, this insidious message that trans is, is progressive and cis is, is boring. And this is a trans, a certificate of transness that you can get from the trans survival guide. And this, this reassures you that, you're, that you are trans enough. But look at the message there. Anyone who says otherwise can go eat rocks. So yeah, come on, join our tribe. It's us against the world. You know, what a message for teens. I would have loved that. I would have jumped at that. Um, you'll be sheltered and safe under the trans umbrella. And, uh, you know, you'll be away from those horrible cis people. If you can read that, those are cis raindrops <laughs> raining, <laughs> raining on the trans parade. And under the, tr under the trans umbrella, you, this is where we really see the function of transgender versus cisgender. So under the trans umbrella, we've got all these different identities, non-binary, gender queer, agender, pangender, bigender, gender fluid, transsexual, cross dresses. What? You know, we're getting into some areas here that there's the TQ plus part of the acronym that I think is pulling children into gender and sexual identities uh, and, and teaching them not to question any of them, that they don't have the right to question any of them. But under that exciting and varied trans umbrella, the, or, the boring cis people outside are trying to rain on, on, on our parade. I think, um, so this is just an example of not only do all those gender and sexual identities have their own flag. So these flags, it includes two spirit, autosexual, scoliosexual, demisexual, polysexual. And I'm just, just showing you this, this is, this is from a girls' school, and I'm just adding this to show you the position of cisgender. And the cisgender doesn't have its flag, <laughs> but where, this is, this is St. Paul's girls' school. If you're cisgender, you get shades of gray. Not, not, not 50 shades of grey, I think that's... A, <laughs> I think that's under the trans umbrella, actually. Um, so, it, and it describes gender as a, a, the state of being male or female with regards to social constructs. Um, and cisgender is someone, and this lays it out really clearly, what's it, what we know cisgender means, someone who identifies with the gender they were assigned at birth. So the social constructs of that gender, in other words, stereotypes. So the cisgender girl is a stereotypical girl who agrees with all the social constructs of being female. And many, many girls don't. And I, I think very few would agree with all of, the, all of the social stereotypes of what it is to be female. 
Where's Being Trans is cool. Uh, this is a young adult book for 14 plus. It's about a trans guy uh, who, um, whose conservative parents don't understand. Uh, find your light, find your truth, become trans. Um, the next area is medicalization. So having pulled teens into this message, which is so seductive, then we get on to medicalization and the need for medical change to your body. This is from Jamie, spells it out very clearly. It says, sometimes you can start puberty early. If this is a problem, doctors can give you medicine called puberty blockers to stop the process for a bit until you're ready to start it again. Transgender kids can also have puberty blockers to stop them going through the wrong kind of puberty uh, for their true gender because some of the changes that happen during puberty can't be reversed. I think this is interesting. They use the same argument that uh, the Tavistock used at Kira Bell and Mrs. A's case, the judicial review that because we use puberty blockers for precocious puberty, it's the same thing using them. So nine plus age children learn this through the book Jamie. This is a, a, a new book, um, Homebody, it's not out yet. But there was a six way bidding war on this book. Um, I think Mac Macmillan won. And this is a way to see your body. Uh, they, it says, they say that your body is a temple, well, mine feels more like a rental. So the idea that you're just renting space here, it's not permanent. You can change. You can move house whenever you want to. Uh, so this idea that really changing your body is, is on the same level as changing your clothes. And this is the latest book that I think has got quite a lot of attention, certainly on Twitter. And again, the, the books tend to be more directed towards teenage girls and, or, and um, that they're either boys or non-binary. Um, so Homebody is, I think, non-binary. Um, and it's written, actually, uh, by a pre-op autistic lesbian um, called Theo, Theo Parrish. Um, so this book is written by Lewis... Um, Lewis Hancocks, that's right, uh, a trans guy. So you can see from the front cover, the cool guy um, emerged from this, this sort of loser girl at school. You can become a really cool trans guy. That's the uh, image that was shared all over Twitter from this book. So the self-hatred and disgust about the female body is really um, encouraged by this kind of um, graphic novel for, for teenage girls. Uh, you, um, uh, uh, the breasts are described uh, uh, as, um, can you read it? Fatty lumps, yeah, that's right. It's, that needs to be gone. Fatty lumps that need to be gone, yeah. Uh, but, but apparently, this, uh, this, uh, this book takes readers on the hilarious, heartbreaking and healing path um, that Lewis Hancock's took to, to make it past trauma, confusion, hurt, and dubious fashion choices in order to become the man he was meant to be. Um, and there we have, and I'm going to end up with a few slides to show you what I think I'm, I'm very, very concerned about. The image of the double mastectomy. So there again, you get the loser girl. I mean, she looks a bit pathetic, doesn't she? And there's the um, cool boy with his beard and his uh, double mastectomy scars proudly displayed. And here, here we have the same in the book Homebody. There are the double mastectomy scars. Um, the day I will call this house my home is when I get my breasts cut off. Um, here's another one. This is a book called Continuum by Chella Mann. Apparently, this is a story of coping and resilience. Chella journeys through his experiences as a deaf, transgender, genderqueer, Jewish person of colour, and shows us that identity lies on a continuum, a, be a beautiful, messy, and ever-evolving road of exploration that ends apparently in a double mastectomy. Um, the Trans Survival Workbook, which was Ox, um, Fox and Owl Fisher's 
um, companion piece to the uh, follow-up to Trans Teen Survival Guide. There's the um, shirt cut off to show the double mastectomy scars. This is Bodies Are Cool. And this, so this book plays on the theme of, of a sort of feminist theme of all female body shapes are okay uh, to sort of combat the, the fashion industry and the, and the sort of body fascism that we see. So this, this plays on that, but includes tra trans bodies, the double mastectomy, um, the, the female who's had her her breast surgically removed is included in this, included in this book of po body positivity. Uh, this is a comic book that got 127,000 likes on Twitter. And this one, um, she's gone against her parents' wishes, it seems. I did it without you all by myself. I went and got my double mastectomy. And I, was, I wasn't a girl. I was a beautiful, long-haired boy. Uh, and now I'm a beautiful, amazing man. Um, this I just include because it was Stonewall's Christmas card last year. So there's a um, double, double mastectomy scars there. Now, this is a book that I wasn't sure about this. If you look at the top left, that, oh yeah, is that, is, these are all mermen. Is that a man with man boobs or is it a double mastectomy scars? The author of this book, A Match for a Mermaid, says she wrote it to give LGBT people LGBT plus children characters they can relate to. So I think it's double mastectomy scars. I may be looking out for this now, but this, I, it, this worries me because it's kind of an ordinary story. It's not about a tran trans child. Um, and then of course, we've seen it on the tube. This, this is a, 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 a real life uh, London underground ad, and that's the person in the background with the double mastectomy scars. So those double mastectomy scars are becoming like a real sort of fashion statement. It's cool. It reminds me of heroin chic. I don't know if you remember that. A few years back, where all the models looked like they were, um, uh, uh, were on drugs and gaunt faces and shadows under their eyes. And there was a big public outcry about that because it was seen as not a healthy image. And yet I haven't seen any real outcry about this on health grounds, and, I, and I, I, I don't think people would dare to, to, to do it in, in the climate at the moment. Um, anyway, back to Jamie. So this is the final message. I think this is so um, blatant. This says, I keep saying it, being trans is fine. It's the world that's the problem. And that's what people don't seem to get. There are, lo there are loads of us as well. Whether you make room for us or not, whether you accept us or not, whether you include us for or not, we're still going to be here. And us existing doesn't take anything away from you or make your life more difficult. Making space for me doesn't mean you have to give up your seat. I think that message basically says, shut up, turfs. Um, that, that, you know, shut up all you women are, who are complaining about men in women's sports or men in women's toilets and changing rooms. Um, we don't cause a problem for anybody else. That is a clear, blatant political message for, um, for nine-year-olds. The other message I think that young people are getting um, is the message about suicide. So this has not come into books apart from the being a persecuted, misunderstood minority, but the idea of, of um, having uh, medical um, intervention, hormones and surgery is being normalized. Um, but the message from the trans lobby groups and all over social media is that children will are more likely to commit suicide if they're not allowed access to the medical treatment. So young people are picking up this message as well. And I've never known such a hard sell, such an aggressive marketing of a product towards children and young people. And the product is the trans child, and the creation of the product serves a political agenda. Um, and it's towards the ultimate aim of, of restructuring society according to gender identity rather than sex. Um, and so, when I think of the people, the professionals who say, well, we listen to young people, 
I think, well, what young people say now will inevitably be only a regurgitation of the messages they have been indoctrinated into believing online, in books, in schools, everywhere. They will only be repeating acti activist mantras. Um, so without understanding the context, without being aware of how adolescents have been so thoroughly programmed into the activist agenda, listening to young people will only consolidate the professionals in the professionals' mind uh, what the lobby groups are saying. It's like garbage in, garbage out. I hear adults even say the children are teaching us. Well, who is teaching the children? Who is teaching the children and who is encouraging um, this message to children? Because there are many adults, not just in gender clinics, not just in schools, but adults who are part of the children's publishing industry, adults whose job it is to listen to um, children and young people and protect their, wealth, wealth, their welfare and safeguard young people. It seems to me that it's not so much that adults are, be are believing and trusting in the experts, but that for this generation of children, the adults have left the room. Um, and, you know, ch little children don't know though when they're being brainwashed. It's the adult's job to protect them. And adoles adolescents and young adults really don't know when they're being exploited. It's why young people, it's so easy to exploit young people. Um, they don't have the life experience to have the, the requisite suspicion. Um, but it's the, again, it's the adult's job to continue um, to try to protect this generation of young people. And this generation, I think, has been totally failed uh, by the adults whose job, whose very job puts them in a position of authority and responsibility for the safeguarding of children and for the protection of the welfare of young people. And the question is, for, for me, the question is, how is it possible for children and young people to ever give fully informed consent to medical treatment when they've been so thoroughly indoctrinated online um, and everywhere they look, bombarded with these messages into the belief that one, they really are the opposite sex, and two, if they don't get this treatment, they're more likely to take their own lives. Thank you.